So I am delighted to be here because I've got the great news that we have funding from um, the Ministry of Agriculture to test um, an overwintering facility. And uh, Jerry Gerard is, in the, is central to all this, and I'm going to let him talk to you about it more. Um, but I'm just going to go through sort of the, I'm going to give you a sketch or a thumbnail sketch of the project. And then we'll proceed with more details with Jerry later on. Um, first of all, it's a, it's a project that's going to be done in combination with OMAFRA, University of Guelph, Guelph and Jerry Gerard and Teresa Gerard of Fortha Lakes Honey. <clears throat> we have three years of funding. And within this funding, we're going to be able to pay for some genetic testing for supplies, uh, for development of best management practices for indoor, indoor overwintering of nucleus colonies. We're going to have a field tour at um, Fortha Lakes Honey so that any beekeeper who wants to see uh, the facility can come and do that. And then we're also hoping to host a national symposium on overwintering after the project or towards the end of the project. We had a lot of support for this project from the beekeeping world. Uh, the Ontario Beekeepers Association is supporting us. Um, they're providing in-kind funding. Um, in, in, um, in terms of giving us some of the hours of the tech transfer team to help us with the project. So we're very grateful for that. Dancing Bee Equipment has been very generous and is helping to, to support some of the costs associated with getting the project up and running with respect to bee equipment. Um, we've had support from the Canadian Association of Professional Apiculturalists. They are supporting us in this project and we hope to work with them um, to run the um, the overwintering um, symposium at towards the end of the project. And of course, our local beekeepers association, Central Ontario Beekeepers Association, of which Jerry is a very prominent member, um, has also supported us with some uh, cash funding. And as always, they support my work and I'm so grateful to, for all of these people. <clears throat> The researchers involved in the project, um, the project lead is Dr. Nigel Rain from the University of Guelph. Um, and then there's me, uh, Dr. Susan Chan. I'm going to act in this project as the project manager, the person who keeps it all running and makes sure that all the, um, the wheels are greased and so forth. Um, and also I'll be involved uh, directly with helping um, both Grace McKinney, who is the PhD student who is going to be attached to this project, and Monica Winkle, who's the technician of this project, uh, to, to solve problems. Um, it's a great team, and I'm really pleased to be a part of it. <clears throat> now, of course, none of this matters if we don't have beekeepers involved. And so at this point, I just want you to see Jerry and Teresa Gerard are really um, fundamental to this project. First of all, we're testing something that Jerry invented. Now, Jerry, if you know him, um, is a real inventor. He's, the wheels in his head are always turning. And um, one day, about a year and a half ago, he showed me what he was up to. And I said, Jerry, we have to get funding uh, to see if we can test this and so that uh, all of Ontario can benefit from this. And Jerry's a very uh, humble guy. Uh, he'll pretend that it's, not, it's no big deal, but it's really a big deal. The other beekeepers are involved, I hope, will be some of you. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. We need 125 nucleus colonies that represent the genetic diversity of Ontario's, honey, Ontario's honeybees. And so, uh, obviously, we can't just go and order a whole bunch of nukes from one person. We have to have them from all over Ontario. And so I'm wondering if, uh, as you listen to the project and as you find out more about it, if you would be interested in providing five nucleus colonies to us this summer. Uh, we don't need the nucleus colonies now because I realize that that would be a, a really big ask considering the overwintering losses this summer, this, this winter. Um, but I'm thinking about nucleus colonies in the period of June to August, uh, when it should be easier, when there should be more bees around, and it should be easier to create these colonies. We also need um, the, the nucleus colonies to be headed by a queen that is raised in Ontario, so not purchased in. Now, we will pay for the associated equipment costs to provide us these nucleus colonies, and we will arrange, the project will arrange for transport and all biosecurity uh, issues like inspection and so forth. Um, if you are interested in this, uh, my name is Susan Chan. My phone number is right there if you'd rather communicate uh, by phone or my preferred communication tool is uh, via my email, which you see at the bottom there. 
Okay, so what is the problem that this project is trying to solve? Well, we all know as beekeepers that the demand for nukes is really high in the springtime, but although you might be able to make nukes in the springtime, it's really quite difficult or unreliable to raise and mate queens in the spring, just because of weather issues and because perhaps of lack of drones. And so it's, it's, there's a real disconnect between when nukes are needed and when they're uh, easy to raise. Nukes are much easier to raise in the summer, but if you raise them in the summer, they're really hard to overwinter outside. As a matter of fact, I think it's nigh near, nigh near impossible. <clears throat> so our project is trying to take a sort of a stab at solving this problem. We're trying to evaluate the contribution of colony characteristics, indoor environmental factors, the Girard feeder, which is, I'll show you in a minute, and summer environmental factors to the overwintering success of nucleus colonies in Ontario. And I'm talking about indoor overwintering success. <clears throat> uh, the other project deliverables are, we're trying to develop best management practices for indoor overwintering of nucleus colonies indoors. And we're hoping that these best management practices can apply to all scales of beekeeper, but we're really concentrating on commercial beekeepers who are trying to produce uh, nucleus colonies for the use of other beekeepers in, uh, in the province. Um, as I said earlier, we're hoping to have an open house at the Gerard facility for beekeepers to come and see the facility and get an idea. Um, Jerry is very generous with his ideas and with his time. Um, and so uh, we're gonna take advantage of of the facility that he has for you to see. Uh, we will also be keeping Ontario beekeepers apprised of the project progress. <clears throat> uh, we'll do this mainly through the OBA um, and also through dancing bee equipment. Um, they will be, they will be um, having updates on the project on their Facebook page uh, and other social media. <clears throat> and then we hope to have a national symposium on overwintering honeybees. Um, so this will not just be for Ontario, but it will be for all of Canada. And we hope to bring in researchers and beekeepers um, who are doing work in this area um, to contribute um, either their research or their ideas um, so that it can be useful to everyone across Ontario. Okay, so what does the research cycle look like more or less? Well, from uh, we're doing the same thing for three years. So this year, we're hoping to obtain 125 nucleus colonies to represent Ontario bee diversity. We'll, we'll begin genetic testing and we'll evaluate colony strength, those colonies strength uh, in the period June to October. Uh, from October to April, we'll install the evaluated nukes in the Girard overwintering facility. And then we'll do biweekly measurements of environmental conditions and things like feed consumption. <coughs> A lot of this work will be done um, by Grace McKinney and Monica Winkle, and I'll be there uh, in the background. Um, and then in May through October of 2023, we'll evaluate survival and we'll sort the surviving colonies into two groups for summer management. Uh, group one will be for honey production and group two will remain in the facility for production of queens or other uses. Um, so we're just gonna have a, a good look at um, what happens with the nukes that we've produced uh, in this system. And then we want to evaluate productivity and environmental conditions. So we're gonna repeat this, except that we only need the 125 nukes once. We're only asking for that once. And after that, we'll just use the uh, offspring or the, we'll just make up new nukes from those original ones um, uh, provided by Ontario uh, beekeepers. <coughs> Okay, this is where I'm going to call in Jerry Gerard. Jerry, you'll have to you'll have to unmute yourself um, because I think this is Jerry's facility, and the best person to talk to it uh, is Jerry himself. Over to you, Jerry. Well, this is uh, the outside of a semi tractor trailer. Um, we built shelving along the interior south wall. Every nuke that we've put in there has its own entranceway. There's a, a hole drilled and, and the nukes face up to that hole in the inside of the container. Uh, you're looking at the outside of the container right now, which we've, uh, we've tried to shield the openings to the nukes uh, from the weather as much as we can. And this is an old picture we've got. We've gone a little bit further. We've got little, there you can see the plywood pieces that are blocking some of the wind. I didn't want the wind 
coming in and, and, and this acting as a funnel, funneling cold air right into the nuke. So these little plywood pieces uh, are painted differently and different colors so that the bees can find their way back to the nuke that they belong to. Um, I don't know. If, okay, here's a, here's the feeder system. Um, I wanted to put the nukes indoors, <laughs> but one of the big, I've never had any success with overwintering nukes outdoors. So I really wanted to do this, but one of the, the big problems is getting feed to nukes while they're in an indoor facility. And, and of course, you know, hive top feeders, uh, bottom feeders, any type of feeder system wasn't working well enough. So I wanted to deliver feed right to the center of the winter cluster. So I, I tried all kinds of things, uh, tubing and reservoirs and wicking the feed in, nothing seemed to work. And I finally came up with this, which is a, a, a very simple blend of parts that anybody can get from the, the plumbing aisle in the hardware store. Um, basically an ABS elbow, uh, a dishwasher bushing, uh, a brass adapter that fits that bushing to a piece of half inch copper tubing. There's a cap on the end of that copper tubing. Uh, we squish that copper tubing in a vise and use a reciprocating saw to take off the top and basically form a trough. Um, drill a hole right in the nuke box, which allows that to, to go through the center of the nuke. And we countersink a little hole on the far end of the nuke box, away from what you're looking at now, the uh, ABS elbow, just to hold that trough uh, level and steady. Uh, we fit a, a 710 mil bottle into that trough and the lip of that bottle coincides perfectly with the level of the fluid maintained inside that trough and it works really really well um, the bees belly up to that trough and, and uh, consume as much feed as they should need at any given time this is the uh, indoor uh, shelving rack of the of the trailer we've uh, made enough space to fit 240 nukes into this trailer. Basically each nuke has its own little pocket that it fits into. Um, and the, the, the front of the nuke has to be pushed up flat against the inside wall of the trailer so that the only way place that the bees can go is out through the hole of the nuke and out through the hole that's in the wall of the trailer. After we built the shelving and had uh, little pockets made that were gonna accommodate each nuke box, we had the uh, insulation people come in and spray foam insulation uh, throughout the whole trailer. So it's well insulated, not well enough. I wanna go a little bit further. I should have done underneath on the floor and maybe we're gonna get the guys in and, and make it all a little bit thicker because we are keeping the temperature warm uh, following uh, Pierre Giovanazzo's research on, on indoor banking of queens we're going to be keeping the facility at around 15 degrees uh, celsius for the whole winter trying to keep the um, keep the bees from clustering too tightly so this is uh it, it, these are the feeder bottles um this uh i didn't have this trailer set up until late in the season last year we're near the end of august so trying to get this filled up with enough nukes for this last winter was a real challenge. We did manage to build some half decent nukes near the end of August, but we put a lot of really marginal um, nukes into this facility. We were, we were trying everything we could. We had little, small little swarms that we saved and, and caught. We, uh, we were splitting nukes and, and uh, um, some weak colonies from, from our out yards that would never have stood a chance of surviving in the out yards, even, even if we'd united them with other, with other weak hives, it just, they just wouldn't have made it. And we even really got desperate just to fill this facility up. We were uh, blowing bees out of some uh, um, supers that we were removing late in September, blowing the bees into a cage, putting the, the bees into these, <coughs> into these bees and then installing a queen with them just to get this filled up for this first winter. So a lot of really marginal nukes were put into this winter. And yet with the warm temperatures, the, the feeding system and, and pollen supplement, we've got less than 10% losses, which is, I think, a, a phenomenal. Um, it's, it's 
I think next year we're going to have much greater success than that. Jerry, I'm going to interrupt here. Um, the orange, the, you'll notice the little orange arrow, and those are showing you all the, the, or those are showing you some of the nukes that don't have bottles on them. Those are the ones that died, basically. Anything that has a bottle with liquid in it um, did not die. And, is, and this, these pictures were taken just the other day. Um, and Jerry, can you speak to the fact that most of your losses are actually on the floor there? Uh, yeah, that's that's true. Like you said, anything without a bottle <laughs> is a hive that didn't make it. Um, and like I said, I, I do want to insulate underneath the trailer a little bit better when I'm standing out there in the winter in my shoes. I can feel the cold coming up through the floor. So uh, it, uh, having a really well, well insulated um, container or shed or, or whatever you use for something like this, it's got to be really, really well insulated. Um, this <laughs> container... Uh, sits right behind my honey house. Um, so we're able to run power out there very easily. Um, we didn't have to worry about um, red light or lights. We got LED lighting in there. And one of the cool things that we did find with this facility is we're able to work the bees in the winter. After we got this full and you know finished our season, honey extraction and all that kind of stuff, uh, we were pulling these nukes off the shelf at the end of December, pulling frames out, looking at bees, um, like in a snowstorm uh, or late at night. And the bees were perfectly fine with it. Uh, most of them stayed right on the frame and, and that was a, never an issue. So this, this enables us to do a lot of other things in terms of identifying bees that may have other special characteristics that we might be looking for, like brood production in the winter and, and, and things like th that. And we do hope in the future to also, well, for next winter, we want to try banking queens uh, in these nukes as well. So we're, we're getting all the uh, strategies for pulling that off worked out. Um, I, I think we're gonna have some pretty good success uh, doing that. Uh, we've got a good game plan anyways. So Jerry, can I also ask you to speak to um, nectar, I mean, nectar, um, uh, sugar syrup um, consumption, you know, how does that go in the wintertime? Are they consuming them, consuming sugar syrup constantly all winter or does it change over time? It did change. Uh, well, when we first put these nukes in here, and again, a lot of them were very marginal and some of them were like just uh, clusters of bees that we'd blown out of supers. So they had no resources or anything stored in the comb. So when we first the very first time we put these bottles onto these nukes, uh, pretty much all of them drained the bottles in about four hours. Um, then we put the, the bottles back on and, and, uh, and they, they went through a couple of bottles like really fast. They gradually over the winter slowed down on their consumption, uh, primarily because they'd stored as much as they could in the combs that, that were provided to them. Um, this is something we're going to have to be a little bit careful of in the future. If we want the bees producing brood throughout the winter, we have to make sure that we don't allow them to plug all the cells with syrup. But fortunately, we can constantly look and, and maintain them and, uh, and regulate the amount of sugar that we allow them to take in. And you know, this is Sorry, Jerry, I was just going to say, and this is one of the things that we can measure, right? We can measure how quickly the, the individual colonies are taking down sugar syrup over time. And that'll be a very interesting piece of information. <laughs> yeah, and each of these uh, modified nuke lids has a, a hole in the center with a, a, a square uh, plywood cover on it that is very easy to take off by hand. So uh, we can also put uh, pollen supplement into these nukes without pulling the nukes off the shelf. Um, you can just reach in and put a little disc of pollen supplement, supplement right into the top of the nukes, which works really well. Um, the other thing that we found um, with the initial nukes that I put in there at the end of August, we were still trying to graft queens and, and get queens mated. And uh, I've used the styrofoam mini mating nukes for that purpose, but we started... Uh, putting the, the, the queen cells right into these four frame nukes and, and much higher success rate getting queens mated in these mating nu in these uh, four frame nukes. 
and adding the queen cells to a nuke is the same way as we put the pollen patties in. You just reach the cell in, pull the little disc off the top of the cover and slide the cell down between the two middle frames. And that was working like a charm as well. So uh, Jerry, there's a question. Uh, what concentration of sugar syrup are you using? I tend to move, uh, mix it fairly thick. Um, uh, I mix it in a, a 45 gallon drum and I'll put um, five to six 20 kilogram sacks in a 45 gallon drum and then top it right to the brim with, with water. Um, so it's fairly thick. I, I don't want, I want the bees to work as little as possible um, in terms of, of storing and, and, uh, and uh, utilizing that syrup. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so I'm gonna move along um, because I, I'm sure there'll be questions at the end for you, Jerry. Oh, my screen is not, <laughs> I'm not able to move the, the uh, slide forward. I don't know what's happened. Get the hammer. There we go. Okay. So, um, you know, just I, I am sure that you're all very aware of the winter losses this year and what that means and the pressure it puts on people, uh, especially beekeepers who are trying to produce nucleus colonies for themselves to uh, compensate for winter losses, but for other people who are trying to get into beekeeping. So we really are trying to test an overwintering method that can be scaled up or down. So uh, in Jerry's setup, it's a fairly large scale operation, but actually we could take one segment of that operation and um, uh, scale it down to something much smaller if we wanted to. Um, we're also trying to provide information about startup and operating costs for this facility, um, because of course there are startup costs um, and there are operating costs. And these have to, to, to um, we have to make these, these things, um, we have to make people aware of these things. We're also trying to provide scalable plans to build such an overwintering facility. Um, our, again, our, we're concentrating on um, uh, commercial producers, but we will try to, to have something that can be scaled down also. And lastly, uh, we really are trying to, to improve the sustainability of beekeeping in Ontario and beyond so that we will have less dependence um, upon imported queens specifically. So again, I'm reiterating that we do need help from beekeepers. And if you can see yourself being able to produce uh, five nucleus colonies for us this summer, um, then please do contact me and I will uh, talk to you about it and we'll see what we can arrange. Um, there are lots of logistical problems involved with this, so I need to to find out you know, who's interested in being involved and then I will be the person who solves those problems. So that's not your problem. Uh, if you get involved, it's not your problem to get the bees to us or anything like that. We'll make it as easy as possible uh, and um, we'll be very grateful for your generosity. So Jerry has been hinting already at a few side projects he has in mind with respect to this overwintering facility. Um, Jerry, can you just talk briefly about uh, winter brood rearing and banking queens and how these two things might be related and how they're related to this overwintering facility you have and the Gerard feeder that you've created. Okay, uh, yeah, we, uh, because we've been working on getting this uh, trailer filled up with nukes and we were doing it so late in the season, we're in the out yards trying to find frames of brood to make up nukes to go into this trailer. And, and, and we did this, the same thing on a smaller scale uh, the year before. Um, and we had the same problem uh, uh, making up late season nukes. And when we're going through my out yards trying to make these nukes, um, we started paying attention to the amount of brood available um, in the hives in, in, September, October. And uh, the year before, it was no problem. There was tons of brood throughout my whole operation. We found uh, everything we need to make up um, nukes for our first initial experiment. This last fall, um, we decided to do the same thing. And the weather was basically the same and the same time of year. And we went around to my yards and had a really, really hard time finding brood. There just wasn't brood in any colonies. 
So we've been looking at a bunch of different things like uh, everything from how trees and, and things like that are casting shadows on the hives uh, morning and night and, and spring and fall um, and looking at brood production. Um, and, and the other thing, even we managed to get the, the trailer filled up, but we're able to, to, to look at these hives and we started noticing out of the 240 nukes that I put into that trailer, only a handful had brood, um, even though, and, and in my mind, we got three primary things controlling brood rearing, um, resources, which we can supply, temperature, we're keeping them warm. So there's a, a genetic component. I wouldn't know how to assign any percentages to that component itself, but it seems to me that if you're, if your bees are getting chewed on by mites or if, if you have pesticide issues or whatever might be a problem with the bees, if you don't have brood um, hatching to replace those bees that are being chewed up or, or poisoned, those are the colonies that are gonna collapse. So this is something that we're looking at is trying to perhaps um, work with bees that are, are more genetically predisposed to winter brood rearing. So that's one thing we're looking at. The other thing is, is the banking of queens. And as, queen, as uh, Susan said, uh, I think we have to reduce our dependence on imported queens. Um, the timing is really difficult. I was making up nukes today because I'm getting queens tomorrow as probably a bunch of you are. And it's just the weather is just not really conducive to making up nukes this time of year. So how cool would it be is if we were able to put a bank of 20 queens into, into one of these nukes and get them through the winter and have them available for now, for this time of year. So that's another thing we're working on. Uh, I think it's very, very doable. I know there's other beekeepers that are having uh, pretty good success with it. Uh, uh, Les Eccles and, and the Monroe guys and, and Pierre Giovanazzo. I know there's several guys working on it and, and there is some success there. Um, the difference is uh, the size of the colonies. Um, if you're trying to bank queens in a large colony, there's always the potential for that winter cluster to move away from the queens and they get ignored. Uh, the cluster just can't move away from a bank of queens if they're in a four frame nuke. They're, they're going to be right there on those caged queens and the caged queens are going to be right there beside the feeder trough. Uh, so that cluster will be held right on the, the frame of caged queens. Uh, anyways, we, we've done a little bit of that this year. Um, and, and had some success. Um, my big problem is coming up with the number of queens that I need in the fall to, uh, to be able to bank any number. So, so we're working on that as well. We're, we're looking at two queen systems in my hive. So we have extra queens to pull in the fall as, as well as our, our regular uh, queen rearing that, that we're getting more and more into every year. Okay, so thanks a lot, Jerry. I think that's the end of our presentation. Um, I hope we've given you sort of like a little thumbnail sketch and a taste of what we're hoping to do. Um, we've got a really great team and I'm really hoping that we can actually make a difference, you know, that we can move forward. And of course, um, we are very open to your expertise. If other people have expertise that they want to contribute to the project, um, we are very open to it. And uh, of course we would credit you for your expertise. So that's just uh, you know how we roll. Um, and uh, so I'm going to thank Jerry so much uh, for being willing to come in and speak about his, uh, the things that he knows. Um, he knows. He knows the system way, way, way better than I do. And another person I need to thank, I don't know if Nigel Rain is on in the meeting, um, but Nigel Rain is really the, the person who, who uh, is leading this project and this project is residing in his lab. So, uh, you know, I really am, am grateful to Nigel also.